I am in a cowboy hat because I am totally the science of sci-fi. Yes. So here we are, and I've got, I'm a space cowboy with my Nerf gun with the science of sci-fi. I really like sci-fi, so this will be really fun for me pew, pew, with my super cowboy gun. And this is what we're going to do. We've got the science of sci-fi. And so I'm going to talk about all the different types, possibilities for the science of such things. So here we go. Whenever we got people hop on. So I thought um, I could take care and talk a bit about the science of sci-fi. So here I am with my space gun. And we're going to talk about all the different possibilities. I thought I'd wear a hat this time. I'm a space cowboy, I suppose. It's like, so, I'm a space cowboy. So, I think that was a film once. So, we're going to talk a little bit about, hello, Mr. M. Morris. We're going to talk a little bit about the science behind some of the sci-fi. Force is mass times acceleration. Beam me up. All the different fun things. And I'll probably take off this hat at some point because it feels weird wearing it. So, I got me my lightsaber handy. My plastic toy. I wish it was real, but it's not. So, let's talk a little bit about sci-fi. Science. It's problem-solving process, right? Hey, I'm, I'm a space cowboy today. So, I've got my gun here. It's a Nerf gun, which is kind of cool. But, yeah. So, I'm going to talk a bit about um, the science of some sci-fi. So, the cowboy hat, because I lack a proper space hat. I don't know that there's a, you know, a sci-fi hat, so I'm going to be a space cowboy while I'm talking about this. So, science is a problem-solving process. Fiction is a bunch of made-up stories, but it's still fun nonetheless. I mean, you know, right? So, sci-fi. What is all this about? Alright, so we got various types of sci-fi going on here. We got Star Wars, Star Trek, The Stand, Battlestar Galactica, Aliens... Um, World War Z, Gattaca, Doctor Who, Jurassic Park. We have all of these different things. Hello, Lucas Gification. <laughs> so, this is interactive, so feel free to jump in and talk anytime you want, and I'll answer questions as we go. So, here we are. We've got, um, I think I want to first talk about is, is there real science in sci-fi? Hello, have we got any kind of real science in sci-fi? Well... Yes and no. A little bit of both. Um, it's kind of like a iffy, yes or no type of thing. So we're going to start with Star Wars. Like, no. We don't have much in the way of Star Wars in, involving some, you know, actual science. Because we really do have the force. It's mass times acceleration, and that's what gravity is. Now, Star Wars is notorious for breaking lots of physics. Especially, there's one particular film in general that I couldn't get past. It's like the first 30 minutes, science has ruined my ability to enjoy certain types of science fiction type of films where you're talking about the attack of the clones. I think it's that. Hello. Thank you. It's my space cowboy hat because we're talking about sci-fi today. So that's why I have it on. I'd, I'd find without it, but it's, you know, it's a fun, it's a fun show today. So the problem is, you know, they, <laughs> they talk about how gravity is lost as they're entering into the atmosphere and they lose their gravity on the ship but then they start sliding down the side and I'm thinking you know if you lose gravity you'll be floating around and stuff that's my thought so you know it's interesting in that regard now lightsabers people are like are lightsabers possible you know and so physicists are like well we can certainly use crystals to concentrate lasers into laser beams and put them in an apparatus like this, but they'd really just be glorified flashlights that only work when the lights are out. So that's a problem with a little bit of Star Wars and the lightsaber thing. So we couldn't quite generate a laser, you know, with that much power to be able to cut through something as a weapon per se right now. And to make it portable, that would be very difficult. And then it's just light. So, and if you had two lightsabers going side by side, they really wouldn't cut through anything. They just pass through, you know, kind of like light through a window, you know. 
And then if you had two glorified flashlights shaking them at each other, that's, that's kind of how lasers work now. We don't really have the ability to give it any kind of cuttable mass. So that's, that's problematic when it, in regards to lightsabers. So, so there's a lot of, a lot of no with, with that, but it's still fun though. You know, I like to pretend to force choke people. You know, I got my own little Darth Vader sitting right here. Now the spaceship's probably a bit more possible. We're getting closer to that. And we're going to talk about that here in a minute. Now let's talk about something called Prometheus. What I like to call the worst scientist ever. <laughs> sat through that film Prometheus and the first rule I thought of is number one in the lab you don't lick the spoon so what does the Android do in this film he gets like a handful of goo that's on the walls on a foreign planet nobody knows what the bacteria or viruses are like if there are any and then he just walks into the spaceship and they're like yeah I guess we should look at this and you know the rule of the, the first rule in the lab is don't lick the spoon and these are like the worst scientists ever so it's really hard for me to get past that point I'm like they paid these people this is like a trillion dollar mission trillions trillions of dollars and I thought they could have at least picked some scientists that passed biology 101 lab to know that you don't just go around touching stuff oh look the atmosphere is the same as earth bacteria they take off their helmets and you're going what are you doing I'm sitting there going does nobody think that maybe there's like microorganisms in the air and <laughs> so don't lick the spoon and they they broke a lot of typical science rules. So if you want something a bit more more realistic, let's check out aliens. Okay? So aliens. Much much better sciencey type of thing with that. Okay. So the reason why aliens might be possible, we're going to talk about why aliens might be possible. Yes. Now, there's there's debate whether or not alien or aliens is the better film. Some people say aliens with the s, so I put it there in parentheses. Either one's fine. The thing that makes aliens inherently possible, we're still working on space travel, okay? So once we are able to overcome space travel, and there's a lot of issues that are involved with that, okay? A lot of issues involved with space travel. Number one, we lose body mass in the form of muscles and bone. So being able to overcome that atrophy of muscles and bone tissue is inherently important when it comes to space travel. This is why astronauts exercise all the time. Radiation is everywhere in space. Yes, you have cosmic radiation, which is by far more debilitating than like our UV that causes cancer. Cosmic radiation can actually break bonds between your um, atoms that are linked together and we don't want you know, your carbons detaching from one another. Um, so cosmic radiation is a big problem too. So you have exposure to that in addition to the whole problem with your muscles and your bones losing mass. So scientists are working on that. That's why they did the twin studies in space to see just how big, you know, how much, how much damage happens to the body when being in space for a year. You lose a lot of cardiovascular stuff because when you think about it, what makes your heart stronger? Exercise. And so in order to make sure that you have good respiration, and this hat is really big, and you have good respiration and you have good heart pumping ability that comes from the gravity that's put on your body. Gravity actually does help you gain muscle mass, strengthens up your bone density because it's under that force. So being able to overcome that is quite important in regards to in, in, you know deep space travel. Okay, so now let's talk about the aliens themselves. All right, so in Prometheus, it was the worst scientist ever, and at the end, they showed the evolution of the alien so rapidly, it was crazy. So, <laughs> I have some people messaging me on Twitter. That's all right. Yeah, we're talking about this. You can talk to me on Twitter if you don't have Periscope. You can, and I see your little messages pop up, and if I don't get to them right away, I will. So, the evolution scene in Prometheus where we see this, um, this particular type of lesser um, alien species turn into more of a humanoid type. It's, you know, evolution doesn't happen that quickly. So in Prometheus, they break evolution. 
because you see these traits show up within one generation and you're like, these are like huge traits. We know that doesn't happen that way. That's a bit broken. But if we were to go to another planet and see, you know, these xenomorphs there, that's entirely possible because we don't quite know how life progresses in regards to other planets and what stages they are in that development. There's no guarantee that we would have humanoids like us on other planets. It also depends on what rate of, well, you know, what the atmosphere is like. There are certain atmospheres that are more conducive for alien life form or our own life form. But all we've got to go on is our own little planet with our own atmosphere. And we know what we have works right now. So that's what we've got. But different atmospheres may involve different types of cellular respiration. Rut row is like, ha So we might have different types of cellular respiration. There may be um, cells that breathe methane you know, and, and be able to, to take methane in and generate it into a form of energy. That's entirely possible. So it also depends on what kind of respiration is there, what kind of atmosphere is there, and if it's possible to convert those chemicals there into a form of energy that produces the mass amount of energy like what we get with cellular respiration from oxygen, the introduction of oxygen into that process. So, aliens, yeah, that could perfect. That could happen once we overcome a few obstacles. World War Z. Zombies. When I was a high school teacher, I had a whole section just on zombie science. And that was fun. So, the thing about zombies. You really can't reanimate dead tissue. <laughs> because you have things called bacteria. Sorry, my nose itches. So, you have things called bacteria, and bacteria exist inside of us and around us and all kinds of things. So, you know, once your cells die and they stop functioning, other, start, other biochemical reactions start to happen. And then, you know, the longer something's dead, you know, people can get reanimated if they've only been dead just a little while. Or if they've been frozen, you know, you have this cryogenic type of um, technology where you're able to freeze somebody for a while if they're in the late stages of, you know, their death or they die from cancer or something like that. They usually, at the moment of death, freeze them right then. And then hopefully they're like, well, we'll try to reanimate them later. You know, well, but if you're dead, dead for a very long time, you can't very well reanimate dead tissue because a lot of the biochemical processes have already started in deteriorating it. So now, is it possible to develop a virus that would have people ha act like zombie-like type of behavior? Sure. You know, your smell your smell sense, sense of smell is really close to a part of your brain that has to do with memories. So if you are able to develop some kind of virus that allows you to um, be forgetful, you know, you can introduce it through your nose to your memory part. You can forget your loved ones that way. We also have, if we lost some frontal lobe type of um, here where our reasoning and rationality is we could develop an issue with that involving your frontal lobe you know where you, you lose your reasoning you might start being more aggressive and angry you could have that you could also have um, the um, hunger for flesh yeah we could initiate that type of response in your brain um, we see that similarly with you know cannibalism there was cannibalism for a while that introduced prions to your brain, which causes your other proteins in your brain to denature and starts to generate degenerate portions of your brain, making you, you know, act a bit weird. So, uh, in regards to zombie-like behavior, we certainly... <laughs> somebody's telling me aliens is greater than alien. <laughs> See, that's the, that's the debate, right? That's a separate deba debate, isn't it? So, in regards to developing a virus, you know, to... Um, have people act like zombies? Yes. Reanimate dead tissue? No. No. And if we did have some kind of zombie um, apocalypse where it was reanimating dead tissue, it'd be over about two weeks. And the reason for that is because we have bacterial infections that would be breaking down that tissue. And we have a thing called animals and weather. So animals, the predator types, you know, you got wolves, you got bears, you got all these different types of predators could go around and just tear apart a zombie for a while. We don't really see the animal attacks in The Walking Dead now, do we? And we don't see the effects of weather 
on the dead tissue, you get a good hurricane come through. All them zombies is just going to fall to pieces now, aren't they? <laughs> so you got to kind of think about that. So <laughs> I probably ruined The Walking Dead for some of you now. So, you know, it would be over in a couple weeks. All we need is a big old tornado going through Kansas to wipe out all the zombies, rip them apart, or, you know, back bacteria and predators. Bears, wolves, rip them apart. So, <laughs> So, somebody, oh, fossil fuel. Somebody's talking about climate change. We should probably add that to the, the list of um, topics. I can add that. Okay, so Doctor Who. I'm a Whovian. You know, and River Song. That's my girl. So, Doctor Who. Time travel is a big old iffy thing. Um, we do not have the ability to time travel. Hello, Austria. Australia, not Austria, Australia. There's an L in there and an R. <laughs> Australia, yeah, I'm in my cowboy, space cowboy hat with my Nerf gun. I have three of these. <laughs> time travel is fun. But we also have to keep in mind, time travel is a human, or time is a human construct. I love Doctor Who. Ten is my doctor, man. Ten all the way. I love ten. Nine was my first, though. I wouldn't really, I didn't really know about the series until the 2005 boot. Yeah, time travel is a pain in the butt because you got to think, okay? You know, there, it's, it's problematic on many ways. So when, you, when you're thinking about time travel, it's really kind of difficult to kind of sit there and go, okay, is this even possible? Because honestly, time is a human construct. It's how we organize our lives. The fourth is your way of doctrine. <laughs> is the fourth, uh, I'm trying, I thought... Tom Baker is usually everybody's favorite doctor. More Aussies awesome. Sydney, sweet. So, yeah, everything that can kill you lives in Australia. Maybe we should have a whole show about Australia. It's 115. You're in the future already, see? But so, time is a human construct. So, it's really, really hard, Tom Baker. Yeah, there you go. That's everybody's favorite. I have a Tom Baker cardigan, actually, that's like, just like his scarf. So, I represent the old school Doctor Who. I just haven't seen all of them yet, and I'm trying, so we'll see. So it's just kind of, it's it's weird about time travel because if we go back in the past or we go in the future, there's so many different possible futures, and you know, it's just, it it's 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 problematic because you know, time to us is more of like, um, we we only have now. We can't go backwards per se and then oh, ultimately the whole concept of time is a human construct in how we organize our lives so trying to do that now we might do cool things like spaceships and maybe there's a sonic screwdriver where we can use some kind of level of you know sonic waves in order to undo a particular thing and we're getting closer to be you know we already have wi-fi technology and we can beam information from one person to another through our devices it's very possible that we could beam information and possibly fix a particular instrument with our little you know a handheld device that's all within possibility so in that regard yeah but time travel sadly no man if a blue box shows up in my front yard man I'm so gone so here we got Star Trek <laughs> NASA was testing time travel with a gyroscope and a satellite yeah I mean it's pretty interesting you can get time slow down speed up and stuff but then you're talking about instruments that we make so <laughs> So again, you know, it's it's inherently problematic when you're talking about um, when you're talking about time travel. Uh, all right, so Star Trek, we have all kinds of multiple possibilities, but it's still not real. So I try to avoid science discussions, especially with Star Trek enthusiasts, because some people are like, well, the current Star Trek's not scientifically accurate, you know, but Next Gen was scientifically accurate, you know, and they tried really hard to make sure that, you know, like, it's, you know, it, trilithium crystals and all that, man, they don't even exist, and if they did, we have, they, they wouldn't necessarily, they might just sit there and light up. They may not do anything in regards to warp drive. So, for anybody to say, it's not scientifically accurate enough, enough, you know, okay, all the writers need to do is put in one sentence. I had somebody get in an argue, argument with me about the, the first new film. They were building the Enterprise on the Earth. They would never do it. They'd put it in space and build it there. I'm like, how do you know they don't have, like, a new thingamabob that beams the whole thing up there when they're done? 
well, that's not scientifically accurate. I'm like, it's made up. All they have to do is put in a sentence that says, we have this new thingabob, thingamabob, that beams the entire ship up after it's built. It's amazing science, you know? I mean, so you can't, you can't get into these discussions with people. So I don't. So I talk about what Star Trek has done for us. It has inspired engineers to make portable devices. Now, if you're a Next Gen fan, you will know that, um, Captain Picard, Sir Patrick Stewart, was often seen holding what looked like a tablet, and that's how he would read, and sometimes he'd put it down and goes, I just miss books. I'm with him there. I don't really read on my Kindle. I actually like sitting down and reading an actual book with it in my lap, and I'm passing through the pages. There's something quite gratifying in seeing how far you've gotten in a particular book, not just a number on a screen. But we have portable devices because of that. We may have particles, anything is possible, hey. <laughs> right, so when we're talking about this sort of thing, we have to keep in mind, science fiction absolutely does spark the imagination of scientists and engineers to help develop technology to kind of help us see more of our world and interact more with it. So we have portable devices. I think recently there was a, there's a Kickstarter to get a tricorder that does health issues for you, you know? So they're developing portable health devices to help you understand and diagnose you on different types of things. So there was like a science challenge for that. And now they have a somewhat makeshift tricorder. So Star Trek has inspired scientists to make things that they see from the imagination. So kudos to Star Trek on that, you know? You know what I'm saying? So let's talk about films that are actually pretty close to actual sciencey, sciencey stuff. And that would be The Martian. These are just some examples. What my particular choices, you know, The Martian, Jurassic Park, and Gattaca. The Martian only broke physics a little bit. Now, we'll have to say my mother is um, a botanist <laughs> to a degree. She um, is a master gardener. So later on in her life, she went to university and got certified in plants in the local area. She was president of the master gardeners a few times. She knows more about plants than I do, and I'm getting my fourth degree in two weeks. Have you seen the movie Primer? I have not. Oh, I don't know. I don't think I've seen Primer. It's an excellent film about time travel. I'll have to look that look that up then. So The Martian. My mom <laughs> My mom has a hard time suspending disbelief often more so than I do. She can't watch Lord of the Rings and one of the reasons she couldn't watch it is cuz she couldn't get over the fact the horse was named Bill and there was a character named Aragon. She was done after that. So, The Martian, she loves astronauts. Apollo 13, one of her favorite things is great. Bob the dog is in, is, ah, I'll have to check out Bob the dog then. So when she's talking about the Martian, um, it's, she sits there and she goes, I liked it and all, but there's no guarantee. He can't grow plants on Mars. We don't know 100% what that soil is like. So she went into this long rant about how the plants, I don't know how he got those plants to grow. Because from what I understand, and she goes into this long thing about plants on Mars. And I'm going, okay, Mom. She goes, I'll just go back to watching Apollo 13. Thank you. And I'm like, okay. So the Martian does break a little bit. Still don't know about the plant thing. I think, you know, they do run soil tests with the Mars rover. But, you know, truly, we won't know until we get there and actually give it a go. So, <laughs> duct tape. <laughs> duct tape, yes. He's trying to fix everything. God, that broke my heart when that whole thing blew up. And I'm just like, man, I was rooting for him. And, you know, science the shit out of something. That's true. I actually, I'll, I'll just say as an aside, in the old lab that I was in, I actually worked on um, a cancer test. And I was working on, like, engineering a part with silicone. So I made a cancer test with a 3D printed um, plastic thing. He <laughs> used the poop, yes. 3D, 3D printed plastic thing with holes in it. I used toy axle rods in a dish, like, from toy cars and silicone. I learned how to mold silicone. And I developed the top portion of our cancer test from plastic toy car axles and silicone that I molded that I bought from a hardware store. That's how you science the shit out of something. So I'm with him on that. I totally understand that. So <laughs> that's a great on Mars exploration. I'll have to check that out. 
Um, I, I don't know as much about space travel as I would like. My nose has been in a chemistry book for the past two years. Um, I know more about biology, biochemistry, and how all of that overlaps and a little bit of physics. So, <laughs> Simpsons did stuff that came true later. Yes, isn't that funny how we see in art stuff that comes to life in our later on in our time. So, all right, so Jurassic Park. DNA has a shelf life. But if we were to consider bringing back organisms that are long extinct, it would have to be less than 10,000 years old. Usually that's about the shelf life for um, DNA. Now if we're talking like millions and millions and millions of years, that's just not going to work so well because it falls apart. So all we got to go on in regards to like reptiles or birds and we have like alligators and things like that. And so when you go in and try to fill in portions of DNA that's long been gone, you're guessing. You're essentially guessing. And if you fill in portions of DNA with currently alive organisms, you couple that with other portions of it. Depending on where it falls within the DNA, you could have a shift in the sequence. There's no guarantee that you would actually generate an actual dinosaur because and I should probably talk about genetics in another episode because every little bit of genetics is based on three nucleotides together make one amino acid if you change any one of those three or if you shift the reading frame to where instead of these three you shift it over one it's a new set of three you could change the amino acid and everything doesn't work so you're talking about, if you look at genetic code like computer code, if you go in and you take out one of your zeros and you throw in a one, or you take one out, everything slips together and bunches up together, you've changed the program. It's the same way with um, genetic code. So if you have holes there, you don't really know how much of it is gone, you know, and you don't know what was originally there. And if you go putting in new types of genetic code, there's no guarantee that all of that together is going to work the way that you think it's going to work. So that's why if we have Jurassic Park, we have to look at organisms that are have only been stinct, extinct less than 10,000 years. And so it's really hard to find tissue that's still intact for that long. That's why they're looking at woolly mammoths because we're able to find fully intact organisms. Therefore, we can find intact DNA. All right, Gattaca. This is going to be our future. If you've not seen this film, I suggest you watch it. This is what we call very, very soon going to be happening in our world because now there's actual legislation that's coming up that will require, that allows employers to check your genetic code. <laughs> and so you might be harboring a gene for a particular disease, but that's the thing. Just because you have a gene for a disease, depending on what it is, doesn't mean you're necessarily going to have that disease. There's environmental triggers that could play a role. So, so I have somebody's talking about climate change on my Twitter and I'm getting messages for it. So if I look, I'm trying to see if they're talking about what we're talking about now, but I guess I'll address that later. So Gattaca, in that particular film, you're talking about the ability to genetically engineer nearly perfect humans based on the best traits from your genetic code and your partner's genetic code. And then they therefore make um, a lab grown baby. And so they fertilize the eggs after picking the best traits from both parents and to generate a close to perfect human. Now the problem with this is that now you're in a world where you have people that are almost genetically perfect or the, genet the possibilities of being the best genetic form of themselves trying to get jobs. Now they say that discrimination is illegal based on your genetic code, but people do it anyway, and we still have discrimination quite rampant in our own country based on sex, gender, race, any of these things. So it's really, really hard, but yeah, it is a scary future. And so now we have gene editing. We will become like a crop to it. Yeah, we will. We'll have genetically modified people. And, but the thing is, they'll be pulling the genes out from parents that are the best suited. And so if you have a particular gene that is passed into your family, that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have that disease. For instance, diabetes. Diabetes has environmental triggers and can be shown to be reversed through exercise and diet. So that may be there. 
but that doesn't mean that you will suffer from it. It just depends on the disease. But this is our future. Um, we already have biometric screening for um, insurance in order to get reduced rates. Can you imagine what happened if they allow insurance companies to screen your DNA and base their premiums on the possibilities of what you might suffer from down the road in the future? Then they get it on record. So, yes. So, holy mackerel is right. This is a possibility here, and this is very scary. Yeah, it is a good movie, and it's something to consider, especially with legislation that's coming up that would allow employers to actually screen your genetic code for possible defects. So, Gattaca, if you've not seen that film, check it out. Um, it's it's pretty it's pretty scary, but this is where we're going to. So, let's see. Now, something that I want to bring up. This right here, imagination is more important than knowledge. This is by Albert Einstein. Medical companies won't like healthy people. No, they won't. <laughs> Medical companies won't, won't, not with Gattaca around. So let's think about this though. Albert Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge, which is, which is inherently true because we look at all these sci-fi films and what do they do? They spark the imagination of scientists and engineers. So, while much of sci-fi is not possible, the importance of it lies in imagination, in sparking the imaginations of scientists in order to continue questioning as well. So, you know, what's fun about talking about the science of sci-fi isn't so much that it's not possible, but it's the fact that people are like, can I really get on a spaceship and can I fly around? Can I go see Mars? Can I do these things? Is this possible? Well, not yet. But the thing is, you're interested and you're questioning. You're asking these questions. Come on, man, is that possible? Which is cool. Everything starts with a thought. So, yes. So while this isn't really a laser gun, it's my Nerf gun, and it has like shooting capabilities. Why is this not, I don't know, I want to shoot this thing and it's not working right now, but that's all right. So I'm a space cowboy today. <laughs> well, thank you. I think, I, you know, I'm trying, and the thing that I think is really important, especially with science communication, I've been watching the Bill Nye show on Netflix, and he's gearing it towards adults, which is really cool. But the thing that you have to do is you have to make it interesting because people who don't particular, who are not scientifically literate aren't going to be interested in it unless you give them a reason to be. <laughs> <You're sweet. laughs> but I'm a, you know, I don't have a science hat, I guess. I have a cowboy hat, and I'm a space cowboy today with a Wonder Woman shirt. So, you know, it doesn't just do more than that with my Darth Vader. And he's breathing. Science gave Darth Vader the ability to to breathe in a suit. <laughs> but the, the important thing is, is when you're doing science communication, um, you, you have to keep in mind, it's not so much about people having, <laughs> you like the hat, thank you, having science explained to them so much as explaining why it's relevant to them. And that's, I think, where a lot of this falls apart and why sci-fi is kind of important. Yes, keep the hat. <laughs> Wish you could breathe in your suit. <laughs> so, well, you know, just show up Darth Vader in a suit one day and say, I'm science in today, I'll be all right. How, how, how we doing? So, but I think science, um, I think science education and literacy comes with making it also people understand that it's relevant and I think that's the problem a lot of people don't understand that climate change is relevant to them that it will affect their bank accounts that we're gonna have problems with crops they're not gonna be able to afford their to feed their families things like this um, and that science literacy isn't just a goal but also why is this relevant so as a former biology teacher you just Ubered a time machine to the scope. That's okay. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> so, why well, I think scientific literacy is relevant, that also has to be coupled with understanding the relevance of it. Yes, tell the orange man over there. The orange man over there is making money off of science, which is funny. 
I got um, some flack on Twitter yesterday from somebody who was like, because I went to the science march yesterday. Um, and he's like, you're not a scientist. You're a lipstick wearing pig. And I thought that was funny. An Uber time machine <laughs> to 1894. Oh, so, but what he doesn't understand is he is a human delivered by science, given a space to complain about science that's made by science from his science made device. So people who complain about science and scientists wanting funding in order to give them more technology to make their lives easier, you know, is somehow a, a crime. <laughs> well, as far as the march is concerned, a lot of um, developments that are offered at low cost come from university-based funded research programs. See you all time, whoosh. whoosh. So, but that's, that's what we're looking at. So, it's important for people to understand not just scientific literacy, but how it's relevant to their lives. So, that's why I like talking about the science of science fiction, because it's imaginative, and it gets people thinking, asking questions, and gives them an opportunity to explore their imagination and see how it's relevant. So, if you guys have any further questions, please feel free to ask me now, or you can hit me up on Twitter. I use the hashtag HeyScientistMel because my mentions fill up with really awesome things. And so I don't always see people's questions, but I reserve that hashtag for people who have science questions that they want answered. And so given that the internet has a lot of false information on it, it's nice to be able to have an individual and say, yeah, that's not so accurate, but here's some information where it is accurate and where you can find it. I've given you a lot to think about. Okay. <laughs> Well, perhaps it's time for a, a tea break or a coffee break. <laughs> and I've got to hop, I hop onto Facebook and I give the same talk on my Facebook account and Facebook Live and interact there. And then I also post my videos on YouTube and my videos stay up on Periscope forever. Love, Kip. <laughs> so, pow, pow. My gun doesn't shoot. I'm so mad. I have to figure out what happened. But that's all right. It doesn't like, ah, there we go. <laughs> I just hit something. <laughs> Locked and loaded, I already shot one. Barrel's empty. How many more I got? Five. <laughs> Enjoy your Sunday. And I will see you guys next Saturday for the next science topic. And I'll post the poll for you to vote which one you want. It's all viewer generated and everything I talk about is picked by the viewers. So have an awesome Sunday. Go on over to Facebook now if you want to see me there. Scientist Mel is the page there as well. Enjoy your day. Don't look down the barrel of a loaded gun. Not when it's a Nerf, man. That'll take your eye out. <laughs> Get out of my sack. Bye. Thanks for watching.